Hey over there, Joe Launchbox. And Joy Nightingale. And today we have landed right here in the Catskill Mountains. Now you see, some folks like to get away. They like to take a holiday from the neighborhood. Some of those people hop a flight to Miami Beach or to Hollywood. We're hopping in the minivan for a Hudson River ride up to the Catskills, because we're in a New York state of mind. Um, isn't that really dull? I don't think so. I think it might be. You might be right. I might be crazy. Or I just might be the lunatic you're looking for. Isn't that him again? All right, we just saw my concert a few months ago. But we are in a New York state of mind. We are here in the Casco Mountains, and we got a treat for you. See, right to my side, hearing all that traffic, that's Route 28. Now, Route 28 isn't just any old road. Let me, let me get something to show you. Many moons ago, I got drives of a lifetime, 500 of the world's most spectacular trips by National Geographic. And when I turned to page 59, Catskill Mountain Drive, New York, the beautiful scenery of the Catskill Mountains make for a peaceful drive along New York 28, following the Esopus Creek into the Radiant Mountain Range and hike to the summit of Bel Air Mountain for superb views of peaks and forests. Well, we're not hiking to the top of Bel Air Mountain, but we are driving Route 28, and it is beautiful scenery, but there's actually way more than that. Along Route 28, I love, because I've been coming here since I've been a little kid, there's tons of weird roadside attractions and also folk art, and that's what we're gonna focus on. Some of those beautiful folk arts, stuff that people might just drive by, not take a moment to enjoy, mm -hmm. and uh, they're worth it. Oh yeah. We have some weird, it's stock called fabulous furniture that is definitely not furniture but it's fabulous it is fabulous some giant native american totem poles one of the world's largest of some things don't want to give it away so i hope you are ready to step right up and go for this ride but before you do what i think they should do is make sure before we go any further and start this journey that you subscribe to this channel mm -hmm. if you haven't done it yet it's the first video that you're ever watching of ours because this isn't our only journey, Route 28. We go on lots of them, and you could ring the bell so you know when other of those journeys happen. Yep. You could like this video, because the more likes, the better it is, the more journeys we go on. And comment if there's any other drives of a lifetime we should go on. But it's time to hit that road. must stop on Route 28, Steve Heller's fabulous furniture. Now you're like, furniture? Live edge furniture, but space age artifacts. Oh yes, this spot is awesome. Now, you might be wondering, who is Steve Heller? Well, obviously you can see, he has sculpted some amazing, weird, welded sculptures that we have loved when I talk about outside art, folk art, Roadside attraction. This is definitely attraction, and that's definitely a road. It fits in my book. There goes Steve in the back. There he goes. So Steve Heller might have been born in Queens, but his father Hal bought a house up here in Boyceville because it was an artist area. You see, the father, he was a tinker, and people would bring him stuff like lamps and chairs to fix. That's where Steve got his, I want to say mechanical side, Obviously, there was a lot of creative side too. Well, his imagination got inspired when his father would bring him down to New York City to museums like the Museum of Modern Art. He'd see Picasso paintings. Where like the nose is on sideways and go, I could do stuff like that. And these things were his inspiration. It wasn't his only inspiration. If you see some of these, if you see some like definitely car culture involved in the art, while a lot of his friends their heroes might have been Yankees. You see, Steve, his idols were people more like George Barris. When people were watching the pinstripes, he wanted to be painting the pinstripes. Now, 
this fabulous furniture spot started in 1973 when Steve bought an abandoned motel here and started creating his furniture later in life. He started doing more of this art stuff and this, since I've been young, me and Joy have been coming here for years. I love walking these grounds, seeing the sculpture, seeing if there's anything new. And now we get to share it all with you. Remember, if you come here, do not touch or climb on sculptures. I love seeing what the raw material was. Like looking at some sort of tank, turning it into an elephant. Seeing the basic plane and changing it. It's a tightrope walker. It is a tightrope walker. Checking out a big dinosaur. Trying to see it look like, like some sort of shovels. Yeah, they're all shovels. All these shovels became the dinosaurs, like the plate armor welds together and the rust over time really forms that patina the color of a dinosaur you can feel it you can see it fabulous furniture and I look fabulous hey we even have funhouse mirrors some kind of bird in the bird's nest it definitely is hanging basket form of the bird there's workshops in the back Walk around in the front, see the sculptures. Don't go, don't go snooping around where it's his private property. We are near the town of Woodstock, not where the music festival happened. That's on the other side of the Catskills, which is funny because people think it happened in Woodstock. They just took the name because it was an artist area, so people would recognize the name where. It but we have some guitars that definitely look Woodstock inspired, and we have the electric one. You see it's more electric with the classic car lights on the back. Talking about Picasso, something about this one reminds me of a Picasso painting. The woman's boobs off to the side, her head going one way. Can you see the Picasso in it? And just the stuff that makes these sculptures, what I also love. Having the imagination to take your old microwave oven. Automatic cooking, popcorn, baked potato, beverage and turn your own microwave into a robot. You can't go wrong with a giant robot. I am here to steal your car oil. One of my favorite things, cause we are, Joe and Joy have landed. Anytime we see outer space stuff, we definitely have a rocket ship. You can see on the lower window, Roswell or bust. On this side. They're like, help me. Oh no, the aliens just making a stop on the way to Roswell, because it says Roswell bus, because they had to stop and get their fabulous furniture t-shirts. You see, all three aliens are wearing t-shirts from fabulous furniture. I do love when you realize that, oh, this giant thing is a car. Using the classic car to create your, your rocket ship. I just it's mind blowing to me. This stuff's amazing. That's the amazing thing about art. So much stuff's up for interpretation. Like, Joy, what do you see when you see this? Peacock? A bird? It's like some kind of bird. Okay, you, I see a bird too. I see the Roadrunner. Beep, beep. <laughs> okay. Going yeah, real fast. Even. Classic oh, yeah, car yeah, feel. Yeah, like the flame at the end. Another giant alien. There you can see. The Hellers, fabulous furniture, established 1973. And you definitely see the George Barris feel, like the weird hot rod, but fully custom things. Now you might say, is this just a piece of art? No, but I just was reading. First place, 1998 Artist Soapbox Derby. That looks crazy. Love to see that thing go down the road. Some brochures, take one or two. Don't mind if I do. It says, I started Fabulous Furniture in 1973, but I started working with wood long before then. When I, when I was 12, I used to do my paper route and then ride my bike over to the park and look for fallen trees. I would carry them home in my press basket and carve them into forms. I still have some of those original pieces. And then for the space age artifacts, I love this robot's a cyclops. 
I began making sculptures as a kid, but I went into full-on production in 1987 when my father died. He called himself an antique dealer, but in reality he was a junk collector. My mother asked me to help remove the piles of metal that had accumulated over the years, and on the way to the dump, I looked in the rearview mirror and realized I was about to throw away a gold mine. I began welding in earnest that summer and I found that my father had a great eye. My sculptures have appeared around the world and my Stargate sculpture is part of the permanent collection at the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore. Cutting edge autos. I love wood and metal, but it is cars that call to me in my dreams. My vehicles have won numerous accolades including the New York Times Collectible Car of the Year and two best in class at the Grand National Roadster Shows. There definitely has been some stuff added since the last time we were here. I love homemade Star Trek Enterprise here. It is interesting looking at some of the older ones, some of the statues that rusted over time, and then some bright shiny ones, like that alien. He comes in peace with his rocket ship next to him. I do like uh, the sculptures you sort of see, I don't want to say genders in them, but you sort of do. You see this guy, it looks like a mustache, then you see he's got his hammer sticking out at the bottom, attached to the lug wrench. In this sculpture, she has her tongue stuck out, and you see the earrings, and what I think are supposed to represent her bosoms, forming that upside down heart. The, 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 the dinosaurs, the, 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 the dinosaurs. I love me some dinosaurs. This raptor wants to eat me. I know, I'm showing you dinosaurs when you're like, but, but what about these giant rockets and these cool cars? Just looking at all this stuff, just seeing how it's bolted and welded and taking the lights from the cars and really making it look like a rocket. Joy, can you drive that one? No, it's all roped out. I don't know if this was just the sculpture or at one point it did go down the street. It does, it's got wheels. I know it has wheels, it has some gauges, it has a wheel. It, it does have a an engine, but I can't see if it's a real engine or just they took part of an engine and built. I think it's just the sculpture, but it is amazing no matter what it is. It's Fantasia. Ooh, Fantasia one. Since we've been here, I've seen about five other cars pull up and, and about four other alien ships land. We got another one of the alien ships. This ship right here is called Back to the Fuchsia. Not Back to the Future. Fuchsia, like the color purple that's on it. You never go wrong with some propane pigs, but even cooler when you realize they're pig chairs. Does this one look more like a spaceship to you? A missile? Or I see a telescope. What do you see? You see the moon, it's right up there. I am an alien that reminds Joe of a Weber barbecue. Take me to your hamburgers. Where are all the cute alien boys? I did my hair for nothing. Hey honey, do you see my hands? Do I need a Manny Petty? Joy, what do you think of? Steve Heller's fabulous furniture. Oh, I love what he does with the stuff. It's amazing. And I love, mind you, inside is actually a giant wood furniture store. He does beautiful woodwork besides all this crazy metalwork, but I come to see the metalwork, trust me. If I had the money that the furniture cost inside, I would have that in my house. So if you are looking for beautiful handmade wood furniture, you could check him out for that as well. One day, I would love to do a full video on Steve Heller's Fabulous Furniture and get to go inside and show you all that art. 
And I would love if one day I could see his workshop, how stuff's made. Oh, that would be an incredible experience. So that is Steve Heller's Fabulous Furniture, but trust me when I say, you don't have to look too far to see more roadside tracks. We're gonna drive right down this road. I'm gonna show you how far for the next cool spot, awesome roadside sculptures. What is that I see at the bottom of the hill? Is that a massive totem pole? Oh, I do believe it is. And I do believe there's some more art there to be seen. So like I said, at the top of that hill with Steve Heller's Fabulous Furniture, we came down and you see this massive totem pole. Now this is Brunel Park. Walk the land, see the art, feel the spirit. Made by a man named Emile Brunel. When I was a young kid in Boy Scouts, I was on a Native American ceremonial dance team. And we were working on getting our regalia, some clothing, and we were up in the Caskills, me and my family. Actually, it was a Boy Scout ski trip. And I knew of this trading post behind us. That's all I knew it was, was a trading post. We came up, I didn't find anything that. I got this beautiful hand-carved flute from the Cherokee Native Americans. And I fell in love with this store and the spot. Obviously, behind us, the store is gone, but the sculptures remain. Now, you might be saying, though, a cement totem pole, that seems, a uh, a little funny, I don't know if totem poles really being made of cement. Well, you see, Emile Brunel, he wasn't Native American. He was a Frenchman born in 1874, and he moved to America in 1904. Now, he was inspired from reading legends and stories about the Wild West, so he decided he had to come to America and he had to go there. So when he went out west, he was actually one of the first people to document all the Native Americans out west. And me also, being a photography major in college, fell in love with that because I've always been into Native American culture. He lived in New York City. He actually worked with Cecil B. DeMille's in a move, on a movie once, and he became a well-known, well-respected portrait photographer. But what he made his fortune really on was, figure films back then, you have to shoot what you were filming that day, get the film developed, and get it back to see how well the shots were, things had to be reshot, and they weren't always getting that film back. Actually, they weren't getting the film back that same day. So what Emil actually created was the first like incarnation of one hour film developing. And this helped studios out because they would get their film back and that they shot that morning and see it at night. I wonder if that's where the term the dailies came from when you're working on your films. And he took that money, he moved up here to upstate New York, and he opened, he bought something called the Brown Hotel, and he opened Le Chalet Indian. And he ran this hotel from 1920s to the 40s. He did pass away in 1944. A bunch of celebrities, a bunch of politicians. In fact, FDR once stayed here and said, that Brunel made the best pancakes he ever had. And to fit with the theme, he made these giant cement sculptures of Native American. So you have to remember, this is a Frenchman living in America's interpretation of the Native American culture. And these things are on the National Historic of Register Places. And it's funny because they're right up this path up this hill. From the road, you drive right by them so you gotta make sure you stop and see it. It always fascinates me when things are on like the honor system, like, come in, but give us a $5 donation. I'm not saying you shouldn't, you definitely should give the $5 donation, but I love how people are trusting. Not in New York City, that's why he moved upstate. It went, it went to bite me. I like a little brochure so you can see what each sculptures are. I knew the sculptures, I didn't know their names before. So it's saying that these sculptures were constructed from 1929 to 1941. Like I said, he came here in the mid 20s and lived to 1944. The larger term to construct from concrete applied to a wire mesh armature 
filled with rocks, cedar logs, and stones to make them sturdy. Most are sunk 10 feet into the ground. The larger ones weigh approximately 20 tons. The two that we saw in front are the cabin totems, the Statue de la Tetori, completed in 1929. In the front of the log cabin depicts Brunel, his family, and an animistic symbol local to our area, the eagle totem, was completed in 1941, is one of the pairs that used to flank the driveway. The left wall is the rondel, which sports the profile of Emile Brunel and his wife Gladys, framed by the house motto, Les Dons de Dieu, or Gift of God, and the right across the front of the house is an Indian village cel celebrating the return from the hunt. I didn't realize when we were looking at the relief of him and his family, the little dog beneath it. That marks the grave of Caprice, his Brussels griffin, who mm. lived up to the age of 22. That's a really good age for a dog. And the it says that the statue actually bears his original dog tag. Oh my god, the, the, that's crazy. Figure this been here since the 20s or 30s, and the statue is still wearing the dog's tag from back in the day around his neck. And it's a Brussels griffin. I never used to have one. But my good friend, one of my tattoo artists, Chris, I used to work with him. I used to babysit his Brussels griffin named Jabby. Oh, such a sweet dog. So I'm sure this dog was such a cute baby. Authorized trading posts. Authentic Indian made. Oh, I so wish that was still open. I loved this trading post so much when I was a kid. Up the path we come to the fountain centerpiece. That would be this. With another stalk and one of Brunel's beloved frogs. So we have the stalk on top, the stalk here, and there's the frog. Obviously there's no water in the fountain at this moment. Here's the white stalk. An homage to the white Sicconi storks, a Brunel's native Alsace. I guess it's a town in France, I know I'm pronouncing that terribly wrong. Yeah, but you see what I mean by, if you didn't know this was here, you might see the totem poles on the road, stop, take a photo, but you wouldn't know about this path up to all these other sculptures. The Indian chief that presides over the grill on the back deck function as the chimney of his outdoor grill. Oh, that's awesome. It's crazy. It's like walking by famous photographer's house. Here's his barbecue. There's his grill. We saw his dog. Still go higher. Oh, wow. This is amazing. I know what I already see. I haven't been here in years, but you don't know what you're about to see. Get ready, this is awesome. Look at the size of these statues. Just tucked up, hidden on this path. Large Native American reaching out to the sun. I don't know what this guy's supposed to be. He's very unicorn-esque. Got one little horn. Or a dragon? Are you a dragon? A little gargoyle. Hello, Mr. Gargoyle. So you could be a dragon. Big frog, little gargoyle. Well, this is the gargoyle. He eats some ants. They're just crawling all over him into his mouth. They represent the gargoyles from his beloved St. Nicholas Cathedral in his hometown. And here we have that frog Joy was speaking of. Frogs chilling below the woman. Also with the arm outreached to the sun. It is sad seeing some of the sculpture crumble, but it also is amazing knowing that these are almost a hundred years old. And next to that one, this one is called the Great White Spirit. Now, it's rumored that after Emile passed away, he was cremated and that his ashes are actually in this sculpture. But again, that is just a rumor. And you can see this woman reaching out to the sun has her little baby being carried on her back. So this is the great white spirit, Natasha, who carries her papoose on her back. It's the little baby in it. And she's reaching out to the sky because she's praying for rain. Moonhaw's actually his arms are outreached because he's praying to the mountain gods. It bears the faces of four key religious figures, Buddha, Jesus, Moses, and Muhammad. Um, they seem to grow out of the figures at the base, which are the nemesis. The faces that Joy was saying, like on the top we have Jesus, 
Whose nemesis is on the bottom? The devil. I like how the devil has the animalistic feet. Next we have Bacchus. On the bottom, you can see the, his hair and the grape leaves and all that. So here we have Devidara. And on top, we have the Buddha. To the right, we have Moses. And then here we have Pharaoh. You can see Pharaoh with the snakes on his head. Obviously, this statue isn't based off Native American culture. It's also cool how it has rungs going up the back, probably when he was building, to climb to the top to work on those faces. I like Bacchus. He's funny. He's very jovial. Joy's reading some interesting facts. I forgot about that in 1911 he founded... 1910. Would be, in 1910. I thought it was 1913. He founded what would become the New York Institute of Photography. Mm -hmm. And it says that he purchased this land in 1921. And the cool fact that I didn't know, I knew they had like little bungalows, that was the hotel, but that it had the first ever in-ground Olympic swimming pool. That was stream fed. Stream fed, and we see. The stream is right over here. Imagine going in a swimming pool with that fresh, clean stream water. We have one more statue to show you. Oh, we have an herb garden totem here. One stood in front of the cabin. Okay. It was vandalized, fell over, and was sinking into the ground. And it says, supposedly a septic tank loader was used to resurrect it. Interesting. So, it seems something vandalized it, but it fell over into the ground. It resurrected. It used to be in front of the cabin. Now it sits here in the herb garden. And that's the last of the totems here. But don't... don't don't worry, you look so concerned. Don't be concerned. That's not just the end of the video. That's just the end of the Emile Brunel sculpture garden. We still have a few other things down the road to show you. It's worth checking out. All right, back to the car. Driving down the road near this Hong Kong Chinese restaurant, we found another one of Steve Heller's fabulous furniture robots. We just had to pull off quickly and show you it. A little bit down the road, we come to a spot called Emerson Resort. And these are the Emerson retail stores. Now you see, it always didn't look so fancy. And you see this giant grain silo. Well, it used to be painted these crazy psychedelic clouds with giant eyes on it. And in it is the world's largest kaleidoscope. You see, this first opened in 1996 and it was a 1960s psychedelic artist Isaac Abrams and his son Raphael opened the world's largest kaleidoscope. I'm glad the resort obviously changed. It used to be like this weird Dalmatian firehouse thing next to it that's obviously been engulfed by the resort. But yeah, it might not have that same psychedelic outside look. But I am glad that the world's largest kaleidoscope still sits here on Route 28. And it looks like there's a bunch of other stores in the Emerson retail shops besides the Kaleida store with the world's largest kaleidoscope. We love seeing you and your pets walk through our doors. Please, no trespassing pooping on the floors. Oh, no trespassing. pooping. And trust me, even though it didn't have it on the outside, we do have some psychedelic mushrooms in that feel once we walk in. The bricks are very noisy, they're not cemented. And as you step, you hear them. Kaleidoscope. Ooh, kaleidoscope paintings. Psychedelic, trippy, man. We have Peggy and Steve Kittleson. We're at the Kaleidoscope Bar. Some beautiful wood carved ones. I got one for Joy once here. It was weird. It looked like it had pills in it. And that was the, the thing that shifted in the kaleidoscope. I love these ones. Great job, I 
you see it? You see the kaleidoscope? As we spin the disc, you see the flowers in it? And you see some of these are really beautiful. You spin that disc, and looking through the slit in the egret, watching everything change. There's the world's largest kaleidoscope. Do you see the big clouds in the eyes? That's how I remember the world's largest kaleidoscope looking. It's interesting seeing where the silo came from, the grain silo, that became the world's largest kaleidoscope. And we don't only have the world's largest kaleidoscope, we have the world's smallest kaleidoscope from the collection of Cozy Parker. Just for reference and scan, that's a nickel next to the world's smallest kaleidoscope. That thing's tiny, tiny. Straight up to the ceiling oh and then God. down to the floor. <laughs> Is that great? This is amazing. So that one's called Supernova. Oh. But I'm like, the, the color is like yeah, around. Yeah, around the side. Oh my it's god. Amazing. So then he moved on to do these like fancy ones. <laughs> this one has all dichrome, the light comes through. But oh, this crazy. one has hummingbirds painted. Was oh, this a different guy from this, or is this the same guy? This the same guy. The same guy. These, these glass, glass ones. He does all glass work. And that's David Sugish. Yes. Oh, that is crazy. Wait, let me just do a little bit this way. Oh, so this stuff goes back mm -hmm. to the other side. Yep, yep, yep. <sighs> that's so cool. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's crazy yeah. with like the the reflections, reflections in there. In there with no, 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 looks like a. They are beautiful. Look at this one. Inside a baseball. It's crazy looking. I think that one might be coming home with us. I think so. <laughs> She's teaching us the ones that have like two mirrors to form more of a mandala praise to the three mirrors that form like infinite patterns just going around. <laughs> I know, I miss that. <laughs> yeah, so cool, the woman showed us. It used to be a lot more kitschy that I loved. And it had this big giant fish in the back. Oh, that's awesome. The lights are about to dim and the cabin pressurized. Enjoy your work. You ready? You want to move? All to discover where all the elements and compounds that create everything around us come from. From our hands, to the trees, to even this structure. We can sit on a chair or the floor. We're leaning against these posts. They're adjustable based on your height. You never go wrong with the little world's largest kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we saw that, and even though it's not advertised, they actually have the world's smallest kaleidoscope too. I don't know if that one's Guinness recognized, but Guinness did recognize the world's largest kaleidoscope. Yep. So that's cool. And the show is awesome. It's about 10 minutes, you just sit back in those chairs, relax. It was awesome, it was really cute. But that's not all. We're still gonna drive down Route 28, maybe take like a one block detour, consider it as close to Route 28 as you could be, and uh, see what else we can see. We came two blocks off Route 28 to the town called Phonexia, 
just because I had to come and see good old Davy Crockett. Now this Davy Crockett that's been sitting here has been sitting here since the 70s, even though the real Davy Crockett never came to Phoenixia, New York. There is a big Davy Crockett here, and he's pretty cool in my opinion. Joy, see the family resemblance? Uh, not really. That's because we're not related. Oh, okay. I wish I was though. I wouldn't mind being a frontiersman, born in a mountain top of Tennessee. I wouldn't kill a bear, I'd hug a bear when I was only three. Okay. You get the point. He's pretty cool and he's pretty big. He is massive. It's interesting when it looks that the gun that he is holding looks like it was molded over a real gun or at least a real toy gun at one point. And this spot is something called the Mystery Spot Antiques. It's not like a mystery spot that you see like a gravity point or not the mystery spot in Santa Cruz. It's just an antique shop. It supposedly has some oddities and every time I have come, sadly, it is closed. Clutter New York, see the fabulous Miami Seaquarium. I love the after hour movie drop for mystery spot money drop if you want to give them extra money uh, one day one day i hope to get in here just made our way to the village of big indian and we parked our car to show you the last thing here on route 28 but we also found an old school looking playground you never go wrong lawsuits haven't got rid of this playground neither did insurance claims we still have an old spinny thing and the four person seesaw and big old metal slides oh makes me so happy but all right Enough of this, let's get to what we came to show you. Last thing we come to is a big chainsaw carving, a Native American named Winnie, Winnie Souk. Now, you're wondering, we're in the village of Big Indian, how did it get the name? Well, it's named after this gentleman right here. Not the sculpture of the gentleman, but the gentleman himself. Winnie Souk was around the 1700s, you know, the 18th century, and he was more from the area of Marbleton. That's where we went to the Teddy Bear Museum. If you didn't see that, we'll put the link to that down below. So, Winnesuk fell in love with the settler's daughter named Gertrude Molly Now. And now, she was a settler from a Huguenot settler, which is a French Protestant. But the problem is, Gertrude was promised to a Dutch settler named Joseph Bundy. She married Joseph Bundy, but it didn't work out. So she ran away and eloped with Winnie Souk here. And they had a few children. He followed a few children with her. A couple of years after Gertrude and Winnie Souk eloped, had the children, he ran a livestock raid on that Dutch settlement. Now what that meant was they went in and they let the cattle and the sheep free. And obviously the Dutch settlement didn't like that. So they formed their own group, which had Joseph Bundy in it, tracked down Winnie Souk, and Joseph Bundy shot Winnie Souk dead. Now Winnie Souk, obviously, once he passed away, they didn't be nice and take him back to his hometown, so he was actually buried here. And that's why the town of Big Indian has the name Big Indian, because Winnie Souk wasn't just any Native American. He was actually, they say, seven feet tall, so this might actually be a life-size statue of him when you really think about that. And Gertrude obviously wanted to be near where her husband's grave was. So her and the family moved to this area. And that's why it is known as Big Indian. Now, you might be saying, that sounds like a good legend. And yes, it is a good legend. And we don't know how much of that is true. All we do know is that if you trace back land surveys, since 1786, this area on land surveys has been named Big Indian. And also, there are land titles that carry Gertrude Molinau's family name on land in the Lost Clove Valley of Big Indian. And this statue which honors Winnesuk, an 18th century Native American inhabitant of Big Indian, New York, dedicated August 29th, 2009. And we figured this is a good spot to end our journeys. We started in the town of Hurley. We drove all of Route 28, 
showed you two amazing folk artists, one modern one, mm -hmm. Steve Heller's Fabulous Furniture, then the Emile Brunel Sculpture Garden, the world's largest kaleidoscope. So cool. Yeah, I so love it. We did it. I love going in there. I'm not supposed to know, I think I got a baseball kaleidoscope as a Christmas present this year. I'm excited. Um, Don't worry, you'll forget about it. I will forget about it. <laughs> so the Davy Crockett, off the road, Infinexia, mm -hmm. ending here in Big Indian, next to the statue of Winnie Souk. All in all, I love journeys like this, and I appreciate all of you at home that stuck to the end and saw this whole entire journey with us. We really appreciate that, and when you watch all of our other journeys. But I think we could call it right now. I think so. Route 28, here up in the Catskills. Been, Been there, there, done, done that. that. Remember, folks, safe travels. Good eats. And live life. Going up. <laughs> Woo! Oh! <laughs> oh my gosh. This is cool. I'm actually on the old school thing. I have not seen these since, like, I don't even remember how old I was and Joe's trying to reach for this thing. It's so funny. We'll catch him on the next pass around. See, look, he's trying to reach. <laughs> Woo! Whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> we, we couldn't pass up the playground. Nope, not at all. All right, Joy, I'll see you later. Bye. Wait, what? So long. <laughs>